evening and welcome to this third in our series of um, virtual training sessions. So if you're watching this now, you'll be muted after the actual event. Um, so for your benefit, we uh, talked about uh, leaving this evening in the session. Um, I'm going to upload the PowerPoint now to this and I'm going to start letting people that room as well. So for you uh, watching it on YouTube, your fast forward, uh, rewind, pause it, watch it times but um, hopefully you enjoy it and you might be able to make it for the next session, which will be on circulation. on uh, probably fast for about 10 minutes um, before own benefit about the whole thing. Right, we've got about 10 minutes now. Um, start to join. Getting them. Okay. Stage. Trying to get it come in. Add 
they take that open as well, but unfortunately, our point is and we're down to Jackie Pia. Pushing back, I said, it's now time for the final chase. Um, Les has got his um, on in the background, so Les, I've just put you on mute, mate. Um, you've got about eight minutes before to start. You're the first one in, so welcome to tonight's session. Just to make you aware, Les, we are recording this session so that we can put this onto YouTube. Um, afterwards, so people can watch it back again. In the session as well. Hello, hi, Jason. Hi, everybody. Hiya, Paul. Um, just to let you know, mate, this session is being recorded at the moment so that we can put it onto YouTube. Um, okay. Where, but you okay? Yeah, fine, thank you. Yeah, not bad at all. Yeah, pr pretty good. And yourself? Yeah, I'm doing all right, mate. Doing all right. Good, good. good. Are we having videos off, videos on, muting? How are we going to work this this evening? So yes. I know. Uh, what we're going to do is keep cameras off. Um, okay. And when more people join us, I'll get you to mute. And then you can kind of unmute as you want to talk. Um, but what I'm going to, we, we still have the text messaging going. But what okay. I'm for more people to um, be muting and unmuting because the verbal side of it is better. Okay, that's fine. I understand. No problem at all. Evening, Peter. Evening. You okay, mate? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. That's what you like to hear. Yeah. Loads coming in now. Oh, another Peter. Here we go. We've got two Peters in, which is great. Here we are. Evening, Mr. Richard. Uh, Jason, you know your um, video on YouTube? Yes. I, I don't know what you can do, but the autofocus was hunting. Uh, I'm not yes, sure. I am. I'm not sure if it's because of the amount of white, because of the whiteboard. I'm very, very aware of that. Um, and I was talking to someone else about it and I was saying if I was making it for a long term keep and everything else, I would have re-recorded it. But to be honest, because it was just a real quick one for this session, I wasn't <clears> yeah. worried. On that. Yes, it's something I have on there. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine for us. Yeah. Um, but what I've just done is we've just painted a wall green in our house. So we're going to have a bit of a green screen going on as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have a little play with different uh, different bits and pieces with with recording and that. And at the moment, these only get recorded on my boy's uh, phone. So yeah. uh, we, we're going to have a look at maybe investing in a small camera or something um, to do these. But it depends how many we end up doing, how much we end up doing of these. Even Gary. Uh, Jason, are you going to put the Welsh ambulance logo on the green wall? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently with green screen, I can do anything. I can have any logo on there. Apparently, okay. As, as long as it's not, as long as it's not green. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, we was a bit worried about me wearing my green uniform up against it. Yeah, you'd be yeah. invisible. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> evening, sir. Dave of Monmouth is with us. Please all stand. Okay. <laughs> Take a bow. <laughs> oh, Dave's got his hand up already. Love it. 
Good. So guys, just as a reminder, this whole session is being recorded and uh, will be going on YouTube. Um, so I will get you to mute, uh, keep unmuting to join in verbally in the discussion. Uh, we will open up the meeting chat. The meeting chat doesn't get recorded on YouTube, so make you aware of that. Okay. Um, we've got about another four minutes, guys, before um, I actually start. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a few more join us and we'll uh, we get into it. Oh, Kerry's in as well. Good stuff. So, evening, Kerry. Hi there, you're Kerry. Yeah, good. So, uh, poor old Kerry, she was on her own doing the recorded session for me for the, uh, the first one uh, to, to do the repeat of it. So bless her. Um, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> no problem. I've just read Dave of Monmouth's uh, message. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. Um, oh, no, Eddie's in as well. Good. Guys, what I'm going to get you to do is when you're ready, going to get you to start muting for me, purely because uh, with more than one person, we do get a little bit of echoing. So when you're ready, if you just go on mute for me, that would be great. Um, and then what I do is uh, I'll get people to unmute. I know it can be quite chaotic when there's lots of us, um, but I think the verbal discussion is going to be best. Excellent. Hanan's with us as well. We've got a good old group tonight, so we, we should have a good discussion. Um, I'm aware that one person may have to leave the... Uh, the chat a bit early uh, but in all fairness as always we're not sure how long this is going to be i've estimated about an hour but i know what you lot are like and you start talking and everything else so uh, and you can make me uh, make me run on blame you lot um good lloyd's with us as well evening lloyd hi well. jace how are you mate yeah i haven't seen you for a while you okay yeah, yeah, I've retired now, mate, from the university. Of course. So are you coming into the community now, are you? Yeah, they've uh, just started. I've been on a couple of um, <laughs> a couple of runs with the lads. Well done. So, um, yeah, just got my uniform and everything now. So, um, yeah, looking forward to uh, getting going, really. Brilliant. Brilliant. Good. Well, good. good. So, yeah, so um, got lots and lots in tonight, guys. So welcome tonight. Uh, Lloyd, if I get you to hide your camera for me, mate, I do love looking at you, but... Oh, yeah. Get you to hey, hide how do I do that now? <laughs> um, and if I can get everyone else to mute for me when you're ready, that'd be fantastic. Um, we are about to start in a couple of minutes, guys. So just a, a reminder that this session is being recorded on... Uh, I'm going to go on to YouTube so that everyone can watch it. Um so just make you aware of that. Someone's take control. Please don't take control. Whoever that is. Is that Lloyd missing around? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, mate. I'm trying to... Can I kill my meat? Did I try to rejoin it without the uh, face on it? Okay. Um, oh so I don't God. know what I'm doing, yeah? First oh, time God. on uh, Teams meet then, so... <laughs> you totally missed it. I've lost my PowerPoint and everything. So uh, let me kill... I'll kill my... Oh, God. I don't know what Lloyd's done there. I do apologise. Uh, right, let me get that PowerPoint back up and then we're going to make a start, guys. There's a good team of us, so I do apologise. i just got to get the PowerPoint back up now for us, for our discussion. Um, and then we're going to make a start. Uh, this shit doesn't take too long to come up. Excellent. Good. So if we keep the chat open as well, guys, that would be great. Um, and then you can put messages in there. Um, because this is being recorded for YouTube, if anybody doesn't want to verbally participate, um, you're more than welcome to just sit in the background and uh, kind of watch and listen to everything. If you want to pack any messages in, the messages do not appear on YouTube, so I can read out your kind of question or your message. That's not a problem, and uh, we can kind of answer it that way, uh, which will be uh, good to have you part of it. 
Um, so I'm just going to wait for my PowerPoint to come back up after uh, we've pressed lots of buttons. And then we've gone six o'clock, so I will make a start. But okay, I know there'll be people joining us uh, and dropping out as we go through. So I'm just going to run through our PowerPoint, guys. So I've kept one PowerPoint going. This was the first session, which we talked about being a CFR. And then we moved into this second session, which was all about the airway. So those that were in the session, you remember we had a really good discussion about the video I made, the role play, and of the, the pictures there and the patients. I do apologize. Um, I did label them in the wrong order, but hey, these things happen. So we should have a really good session with us tonight. Um, let me just get us up to the right bit. And off we go. So tonight's session, a little bit different. I am going to rely on people to verbally interact with me a little bit more. Um, I know it's hard when everyone unmutes, so you can raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand if you want to, and I will uh, invite you to unmute. Um, but if you can hear that there's lots of, oh, there we go, lots of echoing going on, then um, if you can kind of mute, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to make a start, guys. We've got a fair number in, which is fantastic. And tonight's session is all about breathing. Hopefully you all got to watch the uh, video beforehand. Um, but this is the, the session going to be quite a, a much of a longer video I did for us uh, this week. So it's about 25 minutes long and I went through quite a few different aspects. Let's just get a little bit of feedback from people. Um, if anyone wants to unmute and or give me a little message um, about anything, then did you enjoy the video? Was it worth it? Um, uh, so I know it was a bit longer uh, than the previous ones. Any feedback from anyone about the video? Um, anyone at all want to jump in with me? Yeah, really good, Jason. Howard enjoyed it. Good man. Good, good. Thank you for that. Good. Yeah, it's really good, especially using the props. That really helps to see things. Good. Okay. It'd be good putting some hamsters in would have helped. <laughs> stop. Just stop with the hamsters. <laughs> OK, so what I've purposely done is I've done three different types of video um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, really on purpose, I've done different styles of video so that you guys can give me feedback of the ones that work for you, the ones you like and what doesn't work as well. And, and if you have got feedback, please do kind of give that feedback to your area reps. Um, and they can bring it back to me at the area rep meeting, which we're having every two weeks at the moment. OK, so breathing, 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 breathing. And then I come up with this word, dyspnea. What on earth does that mean? Anyone type in your messages. Anyone want to unmute? Anyone want to come in? What does dyspnea mean? Oh, silence. Oh, hang on. Here we go. Good. So abnormal breathing, difficulty in breathing. Good. So we used to use a abbreviation, D-I-B, D-I-B, which stood for difficulty in breathing, but can also stand for some other things as well, like dead in bed. Um, oh, excellent. Shortness of breath. Um, and again, we used to use an abbreviation SOB, which has got some other meanings as well. So now, technically, on our medical paperwork, we should not be using the abbreviations DIB and we should not be using the abbreviations SOB. Um, but you are right, dyspnea does mean those kind of things. So I did a quick Google search on this. And dyspnea actually means difficult or labored breathing. That was one of them. Another one I found was shortness of breath, also known as dyspnea. So where you've come up with yours, you're absolutely right on what this says. Uh, and the last one I put in there. So dyspnea refers to sudden shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing. So I thought that was really quite interesting. 
So I had a quick look in the JR Calc, uh, the plus version, so the most up-to-date one that um, I've got. And this is what it said in the JR Calc. Dyspnea is defined as a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that consists of qualitatively distinct sensations that vary in intensity. Shortness of breath, um, difficulty in breathing. Um, but that's what dyspnea is. And I really like that. I don't particularly like the sentence they've constructed, but I do like the way that they've made it personal to the individual. So it's subjective to individuals. And this is absolutely vital for us when we go to a patient because we need to ask them questions so that we can get signs and symptoms um, from them so we can see things and we can hear what they're saying and that's really really important to get their interpretation of how they're feeling at the moment. It also goes on to say in the same part about dyspnea an acute episode of dyspnea often have a pulmonary or cardiac cause so difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath could be from a cardiac origin not just the breathing, but it did then go on to talk about examples such as asthma, cardiogenic um, pulmonary oedema, so fluid in the lungs uh, and around the heart and stuff, COPD, pneumonia, and there was a long list of other things. The other thing it also said was 15% of dyspnea cases are unexplained. So 15% of people who suffer with shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing basically have no rationale or no excuse for it. Um, and there was another bit, I haven't put it in here, which actually said that, you know, 85% of ED admissions to do with kind of breathing and everything else were uh, a result of dyspnea, um, difficulty in breathing, because it's all kind of linked in. So it's a high percentage of stuff that goes to it. So although I've labelled this breathing, that dyspnea word needs to be kind of used. And I would expect to see you guys writing that down now. So when you're doing your paperwork and you're doing a narrative for us, we would really expect to see that. So what do I want us to discuss tonight? Because I really do want you guys to get involved in this. Well, I'd like to start off with why do we breathe? So let's kick off with that one then, guys. Let's have somebody, say, if anyone wants to unmute, just raise your hand for me. Let me see that. Um, if not, tap in the message and I'll start reading them out. To live, we do. Okay. Let's uh, get a little bit. Sorry, go on. Um, to expel uh, waste gases. Excellent. What particular waste gases do we want to expel? Uh, CO2. CO2. Brilliant. So intake oxygen, expel CO2. And uh, live is what Steve has said. Good. So where does the CO2 come from? Where does the CO2 come from? To inspire oxygen, expel CO2? Yes, the Dave of Monmouth is coming there with the cells. Absolutely. So um, cellular, yes, the body cells. Excellent. So CO2 is actually produced by us. It's a waste product product produced by us. So when we breathe out, if I was to capture that breath, I've got it, and I measure that bit of breath, how much CO2 is in there in a percentage? What percentage of my breath, so my overall breath is 100%, what percentage of that of my breath is CO2? Or so Roger's on the money there with roughly 4%, okay? Um, Aaron, you've come up with 20-21%. Um, not quite. It's a bit too much. OK, so if I measure a piece of air now before I breathe in, um, Pete's already come up with the answer. If I measure the air now with when before I breathe it in, how much CO2 is in the air? 0.04% is what's in the air. OK, so there's not a lot in the air. But if I breathe, when I breathe out, I uh, breathing, excelling, um, four percent CO2. So I've produced that in my body, and it's a waste product. How does my body know 
about the level of CO2. Where am I registering that level of CO2? So what in my body, the brain, okay, so yes, so a uh, part of the brain does, okay, so there is parts of the brain, but it's somewhere else. These signals are really sent back to the brain. Oh, the carotid arch, excellent. So yes, it's in our major blood vessels. So in our big major blood vessels, um, the carotid arch, the arch of the aorta, um, and the carotid um, arteries is where our uh, brain has actually got sensors which register the level of CO2. And if that level of CO2 starts to build up, our brain says, now it's time to breathe. OK, so that's why we breathe is because we build it up. Um, and before people do these kind of sessions or do this course, they often, you know, you say to someone, why do we breathe? And it's like, oh, we need oxygen. But it's not. We don't breathe because we need oxygen. Yes, we do need oxygen, but we breathe because we're building up that CO2, which is poisonous and dangerous for us. So we've got to get rid of it. And in the video that you saw, I kind of explained some of that, where I left a pulse oximeter on my finger, and I can't remember what reading I had, but essentially when I held my breath, my oxygen levels didn't change. If I would have held it for a lot longer, they would have, but holding it for as long as I could, 30 seconds or whatever it was, my oxygen levels didn't change, uh, which was really quite interesting. But my CO2 started to change and my heart rate started to change as compensatory mechanisms. So um, breathing is because of the CO2. If you think, oh, Pete's, Pete's on here, isn't he? Thinking about divers, um, particularly free divers, uh, people who swim underwater for a long period of time. What do they do before they spend a long time underwater or a long time holding their breath? What do they actually do? Anyone? Hyperventilate. OK, why do they hyperventilate? Why? Why do they hyperventilate? What does that do by hyperventilating? Excess. Oh, no, it's not excess O2 in the blood. It doesn't increase the blood because if you put an SpO2 on me, I have already got 98, 99% oxygen. I'm full of oxygen. So by hyperventilating, it doesn't give me more oxygen. What it does do is expel the CO2. OK, so you expel as much CO2 as possible. So if you get rid of CO2, your CO2 levels will drop dramatically. How much longer will it be then before you have to breathe? Because your sensors aren't picking up any CO2 because you've expelled it all or as much as you can, which means your brain will be a longer period of time before it registers levels of CO2 before it says, hey, you need to breathe. Yeah. So we've really got to get that concept around our heads. OK, one last question for us. Um, do we need to breathe more during exercise? So do we need to breathe more during exercise? Yes. So people have said, yes, you're right. We do. We breathe more during exercise. So this is the question. Why? Why do we breathe more during exercise? Um, OK, it is more fuel, but increased waste product. There we go. More CO2 is being produced. You're on the money now, guys. The more CO2 you produce, the more cellular activity that goes on because you're doing exercise, the more you have to breathe to get rid of that CO2. And this is why when they uh, look at people's fitness, they actually look at their recovery rate. So it's not about uh, what well, it is about what you're doing, but they look at your recovery rate during it so they can see how quickly you can return to normal. So what you're doing is during your recovery rate, they will actually see how quickly you've expelled your CO2 and got them their levels back down to normal, which will bring your breathing down to normal. Excellent. So the VO2 max. 
um, yet, yeah, but you reduce O2 as well, i.e. O2 deplete. So yes, yeah, so what Roger's saying is you are going to burn off more O2. I get that. Yeah, you will burn off more O2. But again, it's thinking about why we kind of are breathing in the first place. And it's trying to get this concept around. Um, because what I want to get at at the end of this is not everyone needs oxygen. We use oxygen to replace oxygen which is missing from the body. Um, and we know what our levels should be. But if oxygen is within those levels, we don't need additional oxygen. And this is what we find. And most people think or some people think we breathe because we need oxygen. It's not the case i.e. we don't give every patient oxygen because they don't need it. And in fact, it can be detrimental to some patients. But if we start thinking about oxygen is only used to replace when the oxygen levels drop down low because the body can't cope with its normal compensatory mechanism, then it becomes a bonus and it starts to help the patient. OK, so the next question I kind of set on the PowerPoint was how do we breathe? So we've talked about why do we breathe? And we've said about our brain registering those sensors in the arch of the aorta um, and picking up levels of CO2. So what is the actual mechanism of breathing from the diaphragm moving? There we go. Fantastic. Good. And we're going to go through that now. So I'm going to talk about the mechanism and bits and pieces now. Um, and what we're going to discuss after I've gone through that is what can go wrong with breathing. And what I want us to really think about is having a look at the mechanism of uh, why we breathe, having a look at the mechanism of how we breathe, and then what can go wrong with those kind of systems. So that's what we're going to look at. So, um, Hopefully you saw this in the video, but this is the classic kind of model that I made in the video with my Blue Peter uh, washing uh, up liquid bottle. And this is essentially the mechanism that we use for breathing. So the blue kind of uh, balloon at the bottom in the picture represents the diaphragm. Um, and then we've got a tube going in, split off, and then we've got two balloons hanging off of those. And they basically are representing the lungs in a sealed thoracic cavity. So that's what it's looking at. And that's important that it is a sealed cavity. Um, and because of that sealed cavity, it's going to cause pressure to change. So when you pull the balloon down, i.e. your diaphragm lowers, the lungs will fill with air. Because what you've done is you've increased the volume, you've increased the space, which will change the pressure within those balloons. And because of that, air gets drawn into them lungs. And in the previous session, we looked at the airway and we know that that airway needs to be patent, open and clear for this to happen. If that airway becomes blocked in any which way, then it makes it more difficult. When the diaphragm goes back up to its relaxed position, to a passive um, kind of process, when the diaphragm goes up, it changes the pressure again by making the area smaller. So it increases the pressure there and it um, empties the lungs of the air. They will come back up. So I don't know if it's moving on your video there, um, but I've kind of got these two animated ones. Um, someone just tell me if it's moving on your side. Yep, it's moving. There we go. Good. So what we can kind of see there is the kind of air going in. And I'm looking at the bottom right hand side and it's got the molecules, if you like. So what it's done is represented in red balls is the O2 going out. But there's three balls coming. Uh, sorry, red balls, two going in and three coming out. And it's representing that there's no carbon dioxide going in, but there is carbon dioxide coming out. So that's the kind of mechanism we can see um, kind of happening down in the alveolar in the bottom piece. So this one down on the uh, left hand side now that kind of shows coming in from the left is the red blood cells. And they're quite dark in color because they're full of CO2. 
So this would be coming in our veins. So this is a blood cell which is now um, covering the alveola, one alveola. Remember, there's 500 million of these things in our lungs. But at the same time, the oxygen is then linking to the red blood cell, which is making it nice and bright in colour, and then off it goes on its journey. So this is where we do external respiration. So this point here in the lungs is where we do external respiration because this is the exchange of external gases. So this is where the CO2 comes out of the blood and will then go into the lungs and then can be expelled out of the body. And this is where the O2 comes in via the lungs and comes into the blood. So this is external respiration. So where is internal respiration taking place? Where is internal? In the cells, says Mike. Excellent, you're absolutely right. So in the cells, it's the opposite way round to this. So in the cells, what we have is those nice bright red um, blood cells will be going to the cells of the body they will change pressure there and allow the oxygen to come out of the bloodstream and into the cells. And at the same time, because of the partial pressure, the CO2, which has been produced by the cells, will come out of the cells into the bloodstream. So they will go from bright red to dark red, i.e. our arteries go into our veins and then they return to our heart. We'll be looking at circulation in the next session. Um, so we'll talk more in depth. But this is the link between this session and the next session. OK, um, last little one um, on here. This is a still picture. This one's not meant to be moving for you guys. But this kind of shows the um, lungs and the alveola. And then it starts to show into that last question I come up with what goes wrong. So I've started you off with um, inflamed air sac and things that go wrong here. OK, I'm going to go on to the next one. Then it kind of shows deterioration of those. I know it's not the best of pictures, but if you look at the branches of the alveola, um, they're basically uh, um, deteriorating away from all those bits. Um, and then we've got another one here, plural infusion with the liquid in the uh, thoracic cavity, which means the lung can't expand. And then the last one I'm going to show you there, guys, um, this one will come up as asthma, and it's got the, the normal kind of air tubes, the um, bronchial tube, and then it got an asthmatic one. And literally, you can see the difference um, in size there. So that was the last picture I put on. So now what I want you to do, guys, is come up with some problems that can go wrong with breathing and as the problems come up we're then going to discuss those um, all together so who wants to kick us off um, so drugs stop the diaphragm oh there we go so that's an interesting one so drugs stopping the diaphragm the lung collapsing we come up with that smoke we come on to mucus um, punctured lung chest infection. OK, good. COPD. Excellent. Smoking. Well done. So let's talk about or oh, pulmonary embolism. Good. You might have to remind me about some of these in a second. So let's start off with. Um, let me just go back and have a look. What was that first one? Let's just go back up. Oh, so drugs. OK, so who wants to kick me off? What do we mean by the drugs stopping the diaphragm? Why, why would drugs do that? Um, drugs stopping the diaphragm. That's an excellent one. So what kind of drugs would do that? Why would um, they... Certain opioids, uh, heroin, um, fentanyl. Um, uh, and but yeah, basically opioid based drugs reduce the, um, the brain's ability control the diaphragm basically excellent good thank you aaron yeah you're absolutely right on that they do so this comes up with 
what is our normal respiratory rate? And I know we went through this in, a, in the previous session, but what is our normal respiratory rate? Just tap it in there for me. 12 to 20, you're spot on the money. So how important is it for us to measure the patient's uh, respiratory rate? Well, it's really important because if it should be 12 to 20 within that bracket and it's not, then there could be a problem. Um, and sometimes we can or can't do something about it. So what we're talking about at the moment is the diaphragm has an inability to work because of a, um, a drug that's gone in. Fentanyl was mentioned on there, um, stimulating the brain and changing what's kind of happening. We have a tolerance. What is our tolerance before we were intervene with uh, doing something for the patient? So what is the breathing tolerance before we do something? So 12 to 20 is normal. But what is our tolerance? So, yeah, there we go. So anything below 10 rests per minute or above 30 rests per minute, then we can intervene. OK, so you're all spot on the money with this one. You're all coming up with exactly the same answers, which is fantastic. So if the patient has got rests below 10 or above 30 and nothing else on their observations has changed, and that is the only thing which is outside of the normal, would you do any treatment of that patient? Yes or no? So the only thing is the patient is breathing eight times per minute or 35 times per minute. Nothing else is wrong. Would you do any treatment? No. It might be normal for them, but we haven't got anything else wrong. So what else needs to be wrong for us to then start thinking I need to do treatment? Yes, we're going to continue our observations. So what other observations Yes, if they've got lowered O2. So what should the O2 be? What is normal for the O2? And we're starting to talk about blue lip cyanosis, which is an indication of low O2. So we've come up with 94 to 98 is what our textbook says is normal. So if they're breathing at eight times per minute and their oxygen saturations are between 94 and 98, we can't see balloon lips or um, uh, cyanosis or anything else, then there's no treatment to be done. But if their oxygen saturations are below 94 and we can start to see blue lips and stuff like that, we then quote the breathing to be what? Yeah, what do we say? What's the wording we would use if their respiratory rate is high or low? Uh, their sats are low and we can start to see other recognition features. Um, so, yeah, hypoxia is something we recognise. But how do we describe their breathing? What's the wording? Ineffective. Excellent. So if they've got ineffective breathing or inadequate ventilation, yeah, them type of wordings, tachypnea just means fast breathing doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with it. But if it's ineffective breathing, then we can start treatment on them. So what would our treatment be? So somebody has got ineffective breathing because it is less than 10 or greater than 30. Plus, there's other recognition features. Excellent. We can then start using the BVM with oxygen attached. We can think about their positioning, definitely. But if we're using a BVM, we're predominantly going to want them lay down on the floor so we can use that because they're not going to be far away from unconsciousness um, at this time. Um, and what do we do with the BVM? What are we going to do with the BVM? Give me a little description. Tell me what's best. Tell me what's best. What are we going to do with a BVM? Two person technique. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Yes. So one person is going to hold this on. And um, I think we went through this briefly in the session, uh, previous session. Um, so one person is going to hold it on. So where you put the BVM over on the mask over their mouth and nose, the one person above the head will be having their two thumbs with their thumbnails 
closest the uh, chin of the patient, if that makes sense, and your thumb's running along the mask, your index fingers under the angle to the jaw and doing a jaw thrust. So you pull the jaw into the mask and then you're going to slowly um, do a breath once every six seconds around about 500 milliliters. So a couple of people have put that in there, which is awesome. OK, um, your air that you're putting in will have oxygen with it as well. But where else could your air be going? So we want it to go into the lungs. But thinking about the last session, where else could, yes, the stomach. OK, good. How would you know if your air is going into the stomach? How would you know that? It would inflate. Good. Yeah. So it arrives. Excellent. Yes. And let has come up there. They'll be sick. OK, so if the stomach is moving um, and we're putting air in there, we could force the patient to vomit. Do we want that? I'll answer that one for you. No, we don't want that to happen because that's really bad. OK, so we don't want them to vomit at all. Um, chest not expanding, definitely. So when you are ventilating a patient, so if you've got the airway position above the head, you need to be watching the chest rise and fall, and you also need to be watching the stomach area as well. And this is where paramedics may use their stethoscope and have a listen for the chest sounds, and they may have a listen for stomach sounds as well. Um, what piece of equipment could we use to help prevent our air going into the stomach? So what piece of equipment could we use to reduce the air going into the stomach? An eye gel, absolutely. So this is where an eye gel comes into its own. Not the OPA, not nasal pharyngeals. Them stuff won't stop the air going in the stomach. They will help keep the airway open to a certain degree, but don't guarantee it. But the eye gel is the one which will assist. But the eye gel is not the gold standard. So the eye gel, the idea of it is it will block the esophagus and any air you put directly down will actually then go into the lungs, cause the lungs to inflate. What do we put on the outside of our eye gel to check it's in the right place? Because we're not allowed to use a stethoscope and listen to the lungs or the stomach. Yes, we place an ETCO2, a color metric on top of our eye gel. Now, in my video, I showed you what the paramedics would use on their core pulse and they would have that in line. And um, I did make a mistake initially in the video. I wrote up there five to six um, for the ETCO2, uh, where it's actually four to 5.7 um, um, in the kilopascals. Uh, we used to do it in the MMHG, which was 35 to 45, roughly there. But our color metric is very simplistic in that sense. So what color does our color metric start and what color does it change if there is CO2? So what color does it start and what color does it change to? So it starts not green to red, unfortunately, not orange to purple, purple to yellow. There we go. So our color metric will start purple and it will go yellow if there's CO2 coming out. So that paper that is in the color metric is very similar to um, when we test uh, acid and alkaline um, and a little bit like that paper. I'm trying to think of the name of that paper. Somebody help me out. What's the name of that paper you use when you test acid and alkaline um, substances? Uh, litmus paper. Thank you very much. Well done. Oh, you're all answering that one. Oh, everyone's coming in there. Oh, well done. Yeah, just make me look silly that I didn't know it. OK, so it's that litmus kind of paper. It's on the same principles as that because CO2 is more um, acidic um, than it is alkaline and it will change in there. So we will see that uh, in there, which is great. OK, so oh, <laughs> Pete is on it tonight. I forgot about your pictures. For those watching this on YouTube, um, Pete has just put up a picture of the color metric. 
unfortunately it doesn't show on the video because the chat doesn't show on there um so that's a shame but please put it up there so thank you for that <laughs> no, I'm not even going to go down the hamster route tonight. That's uh, finished. <laughs> you lot are terrible. Okay, so um, put me off my stride. So, yeah, so the diaphragm, get back to where we was, is having problems. We may have to ventilate them. Um, and we said that some opiate drugs may cause that. Um, and that's where it got us on to there. Um, going back to other problems that can happen with the mechanism of breathing, I think somebody said about a hole in the thoracic cavity, or I hope you did anyway. What could cause a hole in the thoracic cavity? What could cause a hole? Uh, a stab wound, um, trauma, external trauma, stab wound, penetrating trauma, good gunshot, puncture wound, ribs, excellent. So broken ribs coming back out the other way. Good. OK, so if we get a hole in the chest cavity, we could have a frow chest. Excellent. <laughs> I'm not even reading them out now. Um, uh, we could do in CPR. Yes. OK, potentially doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. OK, so we could cause a hole in the chest wall. It could be from a stabbing or anything else. So. What mechanism is going on if a hole has been caused in the chest wall? And this is the thoracic cavity. And when, and I don't know if you can see my little model here, the thoracic cavity isn't just the front of the chest. It's also right the way around the back of the chest as well. So the stab wound could be in their back as well. Um, so yes, the air enters that thoracic cavity and then causes the lung to collapse. Because you know when that diaphragm lowers and we actually cause a change in pressure, what happens is when the diaphragm lowers and it causes that change in pressure, it now is going to make the cavity bigger, so it increases air into that space. But instead of air coming through the trachea and in the traditional route, air enters through the hole that has been caused. And when that air comes in, it causes the lung to collapse and it's known as a pneumothorax. OK, so we get a pneumothorax going on. Um, the hemothorax is when blood will enter that chest cavity. So hemothorax is the blood and a, a, a pneumothorax is when air enters that cavity. But whichever one it is, it's going to cause the lung to reduce in size. So on our left hand side, on the patient's left hand side, how many lobes are there to the lung? How many lobes on the left hand side? And also depending on moving the heart over. Yes, it will. Good. Yes. So there are two lobes on the left hand side and three lobes on the right hand side. So actually our left hand side has the cardiac notch which uh, makes room for the heart muscle to be in there. And it may be that only one of your lobes ends up collapsing um, and the other lobe kind of keeps on working. But essentially, it's going to put some pressure on there as well. OK, and Les has just mentioned that it could move the heart uh, and cause more problems. What else can move if we have a, a, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax? So what else can move in there? What else can move? The trachea. Excellent. So we could get tracheal deviation. And it's funny, I went to a job today which came in as a cardiac arrest, but wasn't um, in Newport. And I had a crew back me up and one of them was an ex first responder. Um, and so while we was there, we done a little bit of um, training and bits and pieces, uh, as you do. And you never guess what? They only went and wrote on their glove. I couldn't believe it. The first responder actually wrote there. Well, it's a, obviously they wasn't a first responder. They were UCA, but they wrote their observations on their glove. I would hope that none of you guys would ever do that. Never, ever write on your glove. Please tell me you don't write your observations on your gloves. Please tell me that. Good. That was the correct answer. 
I'm just looking for it in here. What gloves? <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. What are you lot like? Um, no, love it. Right, I've lost a bit. I'm looking for. Um, okay, so you're right with the tra uh, tracheal deviation. Um, and there's a little bit, and again, I don't know if you can see my camera, but I'm reading here from the JR Calc. And on the JR Calc, um, it's got a little bit under the trauma survey. Um, and the trauma survey starts with your scene assessment, as you would expect. It then goes into manage catastrophic hemorrhage, which we've talked about previously. It then goes into airway and C-spine. It then goes into breathing. And it talks about the breathing rate. Is it uh, between 12 and 20 or is it less or more, etc.? And then it's got check specifically for 12. And 12 stands for tracheal deviation. So that's the first thing that it uh, stands for. It then goes into wounds, bruising or swelling. So this is still working through 12. Um, so 12 is the mnemonic that you should check for. So tracheal deviation, wounds, bruising or swelling, emphysema, brackets surgical, so surgical emphysema, laryngeal crepitus, yeah, so crepitus in the larynx area, um, venous engorgement, yeah, so the veins starting to engorge, particularly the, uh, the ones in the neck, so we're looking for that, so engorged um, uh, venous return. And then the last bit um, is exclude open tension uh, pneumothorax, frail chest or massive hemophorax. So it's looking at all those different aspects. So this is something that the paramedic would go for. And I'm just going to put it up on my screen there. But this is in the JR Calc and um, is something that our paramedics learn and will go through. So. Um, as a first responder, it may be difficult for you to identify a hemophorax or a pneumophorax, but that tracheal deviation is the one that you may be aware of, you may see, and put that together with the mechanisms. So what other techniques can our paramedics use? So think about what our paramedics can use. 12 flaps. So I'm assuming flaps continues the mnemonic with some other things on there, Steve. Maybe if it does, you could really put the whole lot in there for the whole group to look at, um, which would be great because I don't know what flaps is. I don't know what flaps are, but I don't know in relationship to uh, what we're talking about at the moment. So it's not one I'm familiar with. Um, how do they check for tracheal deviation? Uh, look in the neck. Yes, um, absolutely. But we see tracheal deviation on the outside. But what else can our paramedics do? What else could they do to check for a pneumothorax or a hemophorax and things like that? Yeah. Stethoscope. Good. So they could have a listen to the chest sounds. So they could listen and they could, if they can hear chest sounds, they know the air is going in and out. That's good. So listening is one thing and through a stethoscope, definitely. What else can they do? Oh, there's a bit of tracheal deviation, but it's an engorged. Uh, we've definitely got an engorged vein there, which is good. Tapping. Yes, we can tap um, and we tap on the chest and we listen to the sounds that our tapping makes. And if it's a hollow sound, there's air in there. And if it's a very dull sound, there's blood in there. So we can percuss. OK, so we percuss the chest. And we've got this special technique where we put our fingers and we tap on our fingers and go through that. Yes. Hyper resonance. Excellent. Yes. Good. So that's what we'll be listening for with our tapping. So we'll be tapping in different areas to check where the um, kind of which lobe has collapsed and whether it is air or it is blood in there. Good. OK. Um, what treatment can our paramedics do? They cannot do a chest drain. OK, so the doctors can do a chest drain. So paramedics cannot do a chest drain. But what can paramedics do? Paramedics can breathe. Or was that part of the other one? Yes. So chest seals. OK, so we can look at seals preventing air entry. Well, first responders can do that as well. Prevent air entering. Large needle. And what are they going to do with their large needle? 
So a chess seal, definitely, yeah. So we use a, a Russell chess seal, I think is the one we're currently using. Um, position on the side of the, in, uh, of the injury, good. So leaving the good lung, plenty of room to work. Excellent. Release the pressure, yes. So what they can do is put in this long needle into the chest, into the, um, the top. Um, of the, the lung, and it releases the pressure, uh, which is a, a decompression of it, so the, a needle decompression, you're absolutely right, and, and in fact, in big major trauma, we can't do any harm by putting these big needles in, and we actually put them in bilaterally, so we put them in both sides, okay, um, in big trauma. So even if we're not sure, we chuck these big needles in because it allows the pressure to come out, the air to come out, which allows the uh, lungs to carry on working and the patient to carry on breathing more efficiently. Okay, so those big needles are really important. And up until a couple of years ago, we used to just use a cannula, um, an orange cannula, so the largest bore cannula that we had. We've now got specific needles for decompressing the, um, the lungs in that way to release that pressure, which is really good. And you may see this on uh, TV programs with the old pen knife um, and a biro pen being put in. Please, 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 please don't copy any of that. Um, this is by no means suggesting that you guys can start doing these techniques. Um, not at all. This is, you know, a quite a high level of stuff. Um, <laughs> yes, the casualty showed you how to do it. Love it. OK, good. Guys, has anyone got any questions about that um, uh, on the kind of the air or the blood going in? We can't really drain the blood, but we can get rid of the air. Seen it done once. Um, uh, I'm exempt now. OK, yeah, it should be. <laughs> oh, God. Teach it. You teach it, do you, Roger? You teach it. Is that what you're saying? Um, we used to have a seal. Uh, we've never had the chest seals in our kits. We've never had the chest seals in our kits. Oh, Roger's ready to teach it because he's seen it once. Seen it on a YouTube video, hopefully. In Okay. Uh, no, it's not in the bandage. So what you get in the bandage, um, Pete, uh, in the Olay's modular bandage is a sheet of plastic, which you could improvise um, a chest seal. What we're talking about is a very specific um, dressing, which has got a one way valve in it deliberately made. So in first aid at work and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in first aid at work, they no longer teach the three-sided ceiling. Um, so what we used to teach was you put a piece of plastic on there and you used to tape it on three sides and you used to leave the bottom for drainage. But I believe that's no longer taught in first aid at work. But um, I'm happy to be corrected if somebody knows. What I believe they say now in first aid at work is you just seal it and you just keep it sealed. Uh, well, you don't know. You don't know. So you get sent to a job which is an unconscious patient, but you don't know they've been stabbed. So, yeah, you shouldn't be sent to a stabbing, but you could do. But like we said, you could cause this through chest compressions. Um, so it's not taught. Uh, just keep it sealed on first aid at work. I thought that was the case. But there are things such as Russell chest seal. Um, I should have bought one tonight. I didn't bring one tonight. Um, but if anyone asks me, I've got loads of them in Oakdale where we teach the fret course. So we teach Russell chest seals on the fret course. So um, we've got them there. So if anyone wants to see them, let me know. Um, cover it and keep it covered. Keep them on the injured side. Good. OK, frail chest. What does frail chest mean? Um, so this could cause uh, the same things. Oh, well done, Pete. Pete's with these pictures. He's on the money. Ribs are broken at both ends. Yeah, um, could happen through a fall. Yes, absolutely. You're right there, Les. It could happen through a fall. So, you know, a piece of equipment which is available and could be, but we can improvise on there. 
Um, the best thing about this seal, and you can see the pe uh, picture that Pete's put on there, if you did have a slight bit of bone protruding, you could still put this over the top and it works. But if you try and just put your hand over it and seal it, you could obviously damage your hand or your glove and you could um, cause more pain and discomfort to the patient. OK, so the frail chest is when you get a segment of ribs going in and out. And what you quite often get with a frail segment is it works the opposite way. So where your diaphragm normally lowers and your chest expands, gets bigger, so the whole thoracic cavity gets bigger, as your diaphragm lowers, it actually sucks in the frow segment. So as this person's breathing, this area of their ribs is moving the opposite direction. So when most of the ribs are going out to make the rib cage uh, bigger so that uh, more air goes in, this section gets sucked in. And then when the person breathes out and the diaphragm goes up, this fracture of uh, area of ribs actually starts sticking outwards. And we see it moving the opposite direction to the ribs. So a frow segment can be seen if you have a look. And you remember on your primary survey, A, B, C, D, E, E for expose and examine, and if you start seeing some of these things here and you start getting the mechanism, they've had a fall or blunt trauma and they're having difficulty in breathing, um, holding their ribs. This is one of the times you might want to look because if they have got a frow segment and this bit of ribs, which is moving the opposite to breathing, is there anything you can do about it? Anything you could do? Yeah, support it. So if you support it, and, and they'll be doing a lot of that themselves with their hands, but if you support it, actually you can reduce the amount of movement of the frow segment, which actually then keeps it in the, not, the normal alignment of the ribs as they're breathing and actually will be less pain for them. Good. Okay, um, how? So it can be supported with just a hand, um, but I say they do that themselves quite a lot of the time, but they might be unconscious. So what you can actually do is something like a broad fold triangular bandage. So if you get your triangular bandage and lay it out, you've got um, three points to the triangular bandage. One of the points is a right angle. That point is opposite the base. So lay your triangle out, bring the point to meet the base, fold it in half again, and there you'll have a broad fold bandage. That broad fold bandage can go around the ribs and be tied off. So the widest part is over the frow segment, and you might even want to put something there like um, a brand new um, dressing of some kind, not because of the open wound, but to fill the gap, if that makes sense. And then you put the broad fold round, tying it off, which is the narrowest point of the bandage now, on the good side, and that can help stop that kind of frow segment moving. But what you will find, they want to hold it themselves quite a bit. So hopefully that's answered your question for you then, Rog. And then the same in the positioning, lean them towards the injured side and the good side up. OK, I want to move on, guys, because uh, looking at time, we're nearly an hour into this session already. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Coming up with some of the other things that you said could go wrong uh, with breathing. Um, and I'm trying to think back because it was way, way back in the, the chat. Um, so um, uh, PE, pulmonary embolism. There we go. Good. So what is a pulmonary embolism? What is that? What is actually a PE? What is a pulmonary embolism? What is that? It is a blood clot in the lungs. Thank you very much. Yes, good. So how do we get a blood clot in the lungs? How do we get it there? How do we get a blood clot in the lungs? How does that happen? Uh, evening, James. James Jenkins has just joined us as well. A DVT, so a deep vein thrombosis movie. So how do we get a deep vein thrombosis? 
Yes, it travels from somewhere. Why do we get a deep vein thrombosis? Why do we get an embolism somewhere? Travel. Oh, Pete, you're on the money. I love it. Um, from Stacey's lack of movement. Good. Yeah. What else? Narrowing. Yes. Good. Narrowing of the arteries or the veins, I should say. Recent operation. Yes, absolutely. Could be from an injury. Um, I've heard about this a lot from footballers. Um, I know of a footballer who broke their ankle on the football pitch. The physio went on and um, manipulated. Uh, sorry, it might have been a dislocated ankle. I can't remember fully now, but they definitely manipulated the ankle, got it back in alignment, thought they'd done a very good job, but actually um, they dislodged a clot which had formed uh, as the injury first happened and that clot then travelled around their body um, and wasn't very good. Uh, this one, um, operations, is quite close uh, to us at the moment and it's still quite raw, I must admit, um, but our good friend and very good CFR, Brian Foley, who recently passed way down in Barry. Um, unfortunately, Brian had an operation, uh, a sudden operation, and he didn't pass away because of the operation, but it was a blood clot, um, which would have been from the operation. And because then he was moving around because he was ready to go home, that blood clot traveled to his lung and caused him a massive pulmonary embolism, um, a, um, a big PE and he just died instantly from that. So um, quite raw for us all, really. Um, but yeah, so that's a quite a recent one we've had. Um, OK, how are we going to recognise a pulmonary embolism? How are we going to recognise it in our patients? How do we recognise it? Um, Pete's got another picture on there for us, which is great. Good little bits on there, Pete. I wish them bits would be um, in the, the video as well. Unfortunately, they don't come up. Yeah, so yeah, pain and um, shortness of breath. Isn't there another name for it? Mm, let me think. What did we say? Come on, Mike, come up with that name. Oh, difficulty in breathing. I'm sure there's another name for it. D -d 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 this, this, clammy, yes. Dyspnea, thank you, yes. So they would have dyspnea, coughing up blood, clammy, excellent, yes, all of them kind of things, good. They could have pain on one side of their chest as well, okay. Um, leg pain, swelling, good. Think about some of your other observations, guys. So dyspnea, um, history of travel, excellent. So you're now thinking about mechanism. Excellent. So dizziness. Yes, they could have. Good. Come on, think about our basic observations. Think about your basic observations, your, your, your baseline observations. Your, yes, they could have low O2. Excellent. Reduced oxygen levels. So um, think about some of the tachycardia. Yes, yes. Medical history. Yes, definitely. So if we start seeing some of these recognition features, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? OK, so could have tachypnea, tachycardia, could have uh, low sat, so they could have hypoxia, um, dyspnea. <laughs> we're not going to panic, Les. Of course we're not going to. We're going to give them oxygen. Yes, we're going to treat for the low oxygen. Good. Alert CCC. Well done. Good. Be prepared for an arrest. Good. Well done. Yes. Excellent. So get your stuff ready. Good. Um, just for your information, paramedics can do an ECG and there is some significant changes on the ECG that we can see if it's a pulmonary embolism. I'm not going to go into all of them um, ones now, but there are things there. So look for signs of a stroke. We can do a fast. Yes, uh, we can start going down them route. Um, but if it's a pulmonary embolism, um, it hasn't gone uh, to the brain, so it's different. So because it would then have to travel through the heart to then be ejected out of the heart to then get up to the brain, quite often we don't find pulmonary embolisms have neurological deficit or have strokes from it. Um, but 
If we were looking at a stroke and we look at circulation in the next one, the embolism is more likely to have been called in the heart, okay, uh, rather than it's traveled through the body and gone through the heart, okay. Yes, yeah, so we would count their respiratory rate knowing it should be 12 to 20. Excellent. Good. So if we recognize these dyspnea, these low oxygen levels, we can start treat. And um, don't forget about your positioning and um, position the patient appropriately. What would you suggest is a good position for somebody with dyspnea, um, hypoxia, um, Oh, good. Yeah. So asking whether they've been unconscious or not. That's a that's a, a good one. Good. Um, so what position is going to be good for someone with dyspnea? Yeah, the tripoding. OK, the W position. Excellent. And I don't know if you um, right tap on me and pin on me it makes it bigger. You can see my board up here. Well, down in the corner on my board, I've just got my C, A, B, C, D, e. And I know it's very small for you there. In fact, um, if I just bring my camera over and hold it like so, I think you can see that. So what I've done is generally airway positions are tripoding, leaning, uh, sitting down, leaning forward. Generally, breathing problems are the W position, so leaning back, which means the only thing that can get worse from the breathing problem is it becomes an airway problem, i.e. coughing up blood, so we lean, lean them forward. Um, if they do get worse, it goes into circulation problems, so we lay them down and we start treating that. Good. So they're the things we can do. Guys, um, hopefully that's enough on the pulmonary embolism and the other bits on there. So some of the other things, um, can't see anything. I think you have to right tap on me. And if you right tap on me, it says pin. And if you pin on me, it comes up with me being big in the middle of your screen. Um, so I think you have to do that uh, to see me and then it comes up, Kerry. Um, good. OK, so some of the other things that it could be. So some of the other things that we could have going on with our breathing and um, things that go wrong. Um, pulmonary infusion, uh, uh, perfusion. Sorry, I thought it was going to say infusion. Um, perfusion. OK, so we're looking at problems deep in the lungs. So what I'm going to do is actually link this in with pneumonia as well. So what is pneumonia? What is pneumonia? Apart from a difficult spelling, what is pneumonia? Inflammation in the lungs, yes. Yeah. So it's inflammation, it's a chest infection. Okay, so um, bacterial infection, there we go, good. So we get an infection, we get um, part of the infection, part of the way the body will try to deal with the infection is it will protect itself and it will build up some fluid. So let me just go back to uh, this one here. Um, Pete's got his little one, I'm just bringing my one back up. And if we think about those alveoli and how fine they are, um, in those alveoli we have an exchange of gases. And because of the partial pressure changing, we know the CO2 can come out and the O2 can come in. And that's great. Um, but if we've got an infection, what our body doesn't want to happen is we spread that infection around our body. And we know if we've got an infection in our lungs, that if that infection gets into our blood, it can then lead to sepsisemia and, and we can collapse and die through sepsis, etc., etc. So what it does is it starts to build up a barrier. And when it builds up that barrier, it can actually stop the gases exchanging um, in the alveola. And that barrier will be like a mucus. And when that mucus is there, we then need to try and clear that mucus. OK, so how does the body um, clear the mucus? And there's a good indication with um, Peter's picture that he's put up on there. Um, coughing, yeah, absolutely. So we have the cilia, the little hairs, which will start sweeping it up. Um, and then the cilia move it to the larger airways. And then we can cough it up. 
And again, we went through kind of coughing as part of the airway problem from uh, previously. The other thing that can start to happen if we're getting that fluid building up is again, our saturations will start to drop um, and we will start to get hypoxia and then we will start to get dyspnea as well. So what is gonna be a good position for someone suffering with this and why? Why uh, is positioning absolutely vital? Yes, yeah, sat up. Why sat up? Why does that make a difference? If they've got fluid, mucus and other stuff, lower areas covered by fluid, absolutely. So what's the problem if they lay down? What's the problem? Um, opens the upper airways, yeah, great. So basically, if they lay down, it allow, or it basically spreads the fluid across the whole lungs, which affects the, every lobe, where if we sit them up, it then kind of um, only affects the lower lobes. So, um, older people who suffer with some of these problems, what do they often do to get a good night's sleep? So people who suffer with these kind of problems, they get a good night's sleep by doing what? Um, I hope I've made that. Yeah, lots of pillows propped up in bed. Um, absolutely. And they sleep in a chair. So they sleep sat up. So I've seen that on a number of occasions. Prop themselves up. Absolutely. So these are all bits of evidence that you need to be looking at. Now, if somebody has got long term buildup of mucus in their lungs, consistently coughing um, and it is persistent for three months over two consecutive years. So three consecutive months over two consecutive years. What is it diagnosed as? It is diagnosed as COPD, chronic bronchitis. Yes, chronic bronchitis. Excellent. So if we go to a COPD patient, what would we expect their observations to normally be? So a COPD patient with chronic bronchitis, what would their observations be? So their oxygen saturation should be 88 to 92. So a lower oxygen rate. Good. Anything else will change. Um, their oxygen is going to change because they become a CO2 retainer because their alveolar are blocked. They can't get the CO2 out. So they become a CO2 retainer. So their sats are lower. Breathing rate, would it be lower? Tachypnea. Yes, their breathing rate speeds up. So as part of their compensatory mechanism, they have a faster than normal um, breathing rate because they're trying to get more CO2 out, which means they're trying to get more oxygen in. And if they try and get more out, their breathing rate speeds up. So with their dyspnea, they will then have tachypnea and then they will have tachycardia. So their heart rate will speed up um, as well. So, yeah, a kind of a seesaw effect, if you like. So they're kind of it's all part of their long term compensatory mechanism. Now, I'm not being derogative, but in our textbook, what is the name that they call people with chronic bronchitis? So in this book here, if you're still on me in this book here, what do we call people with long term bronchitis? I think it's page 128. I think it is. What do we call them? What is the name they give them on here? Um, CO2 retain blue bloaters. There we go. So blue bloaters is what they actually call them um, in here. Um, let me just check the page number for you. Um, so, oh, 127. Um, so it's actually on 126. Uh, that we've got that bit on there. So I was out by a little bit and it's got chronic bronchitis, also known as blue bloaters. And it says they will have a hyperinflated chest. They will suffer with obesity. Um, they will be cyanotic centrally and they will have high levels of CO2. So that's what it describes in our book here for chronic bronchitis. Now, somebody else has mentioned emphysema. 
What is emphysema? Not the surgical emphysema that I mentioned earlier. What is COPD emphysema? What is COPD emphysema? Yeah, so the alveoli loses elasticity, so the loss of the alveoli. Um, so we've got a reduction in alveoli in there. So where we've normally got 500 million um, alveoli and we can exchange the gases in each of those, if we lose the alveoli um, and stuff, then we can't exchange as much gas. So why do we lose the alveoli? So people who suffer from emphysemia, why? Why is they? What have they done to their bodies? How have they done it to their bodies? What's their history? What's their history? Yes, yeah, smoking. Yes, yeah, smoking's the big one. Um, so poisoning the lungs, exposure to chemicals, and this could be from working in the mines. Uh, people have got it on there. Good. Yes, yeah, so a different working asbestosis, part of it, slightly different, but part of it. Good. Yes. Yeah, so uh, cancer, chemo. Yes. Yeah, so asbestosis. Good. Um, somebody did mention it earlier, but what are emphysemic patients also known as? What are emphysemic patients also known as? So they're not blue bloaters. Blue bloaters was the oh, well, pink puffers. Yes. And in our book, it says emphysema, also known as pink puffers, hyperinflated chest. Yes. Body size, normally thin, not normally cyanosed. And they normally have low levels of CO2 in their blood. Um, that's what they're described as in the book. OK, so there's a really good bit. And if you have got this book, this one here, it's good to have a read of this section. So page 122, chapter 11 is all about breathing, um, as well as you can find a lot of this information online uh, and bits and pieces as well. So lots and lots of different things on there. Um, so a big proportion of our patients we go to are um, COPD. And when you do this year's CPD, you will get your oxygen updates. And during them oxygen updates, we also make you aware that in the JR Calc, we now, anyone over the age of 50 who is a long term smoker and may have got dyspnea, so breathlessness, with no other cause, we treat them as if they are COPD. So there's an important update for us um, and we go through that in this year's CPD and the new oxygen guidelines on the um, CFR website are there. And Les, yes, I have printed your copy of and yes, I have laminated them for you. But Les, you're special to me, so I've only done it for you. I'm not going to be doing it for everyone. Sorry about that. Um, but Ange might if you ask her nicely. Um, the updated version on there. And so now any long term smoker over the age of 50 uh, with no other cause of breathlessness, we treat as if they are COPD. OK, so that's the way it kind of works. It's well worth looking at the updates as well on there. Uh, even before that, what does it mean when the crew say the patient is COPD blowing off and may have CO2 retention. So basically, the body is trying to blow off excess CO2. So their breathing rate becomes slower, much, much deeper. Um, it's a little bit like when the diabetic patient, the hyperglycemic patient, is trying to expel more CO2 to try and reduce their pH level and become more alkaline, um, it's a little bit like the same as that. They're trying to blow off as much CO2 as they can. And that's where they get that kind of puffing from to try and get rid of it. Um, 
and th this is one of the problems. And what they start doing is they open their lungs up as much as they can and they start using accessory muscles. Um, and this is going to link us into the last kind of bit. So it, it's all connected in there. So we're going to go into this asthmatic one um, and we start using accessory muscles. Where are the accessory muscles that we use for breathing? So the normal muscle we use for breathing is the diaphragm, which is located below the ribs. Yes. So we start using the intercostal muscles, which are in between the ribs, which means the rib cage will get larger than normal and then go back down to its normal size. So them intercostal muscles pulling them apart. Yes. Good. So in the neck as well. So you start seeing a lot more uh, movement. And yes, the good, the shoulders will start to go. Um, so we start to see a lot more of our back being used to get us to breathe. So lots, lots more movement. So we get exaggerated movement. And this is all part of the body's compensatory mechanism um, for what's going on. So, yeah, we could get some stomach movement, maybe where the diaphragm is working a little bit more. So that will work. We see that a lot in children. So they get a lot of diaphragmatic breathing in children. So we can see it a lot there. But as we start to get older, we get the bigger ones. Um, but yes, we can start to see that. Um, so let's go back to last week's session and where we talked about airway. Let's talk about noises which will come from breathing. So what kind of noises and looking at the picture on the screen at the moment, you may uh, give it away. And this can happen in asthma, anaphylaxis, wheezy. Yeah, so wheezy is an indication of our airway is narrowed. And this is the link with last week. If the airway is narrowed, breathing is going to be more difficult. And this person may tell you that they feel like they can't breathe out, which is really, really important. So yeah, Les, we've got the snoring on there as well. Again, with a lack of consciousness, links in with the, the airway one that we've done there. So that wheezy noising is what we're going to worry about with the breathing because they kind of go in together and link in with the breathing um, uh, as tonight's kind of uh, uh, discussion group. Excellent. OK, so we've only got about 10 minutes left, guys. So I want to talk about we've already talked about um, positioning the patient. That's really important. Um, we've already talked about taking observations. So we would continuously and somebody just for the sake of it. Can you just tell me the order in which we would take observations? Um, so someone just write out the first letter of it that we would take observations. We would always document them observations um, on our paperwork, not on our gloves. OK, so we would document it. Someone just going to come up with them letters for me in the order we would do our observations. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is the treatment. Hey, thank you, Mike. The A, B, C, D, E. Excellent. So the classic primary survey. Keep following the um, A, B, C, D, E. So on the A, we're going to be revisiting their SpO2 and looking at their oxygen levels and getting them in the right rate. Um, and that's the bit I want to concentrate on now is administering oxygen. So we know uh, we only need to give oxygen if that patient drops below 94. Um, too simple. Thought you were trying to. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, just a nice, simple one. Keeping it simple. That's me all over. I am very simple, um, apparently. So, yeah, so it's the um, oxygen that I want to concentrate on. So there are a couple of conditions which are in the red list. Um, <laughs> I'm just reading um, Roger's comments there. Um, there's a couple of conditions in the red list where we would give them oxygen immediately without even measuring their SpO2. Um, just tap me something in there. Tap me something in. Yeah, so hypoxia trauma. Yeah, big trauma. We give them oxygen, definitely. So big trauma. We always give them cardiac arrest. We always give them oxygen. Yes, if they're actively fitting, why do we give them lots of oxygen if they're actively fitting? There's two reasons. OK, why do we give them lots of oxygen if they're actively fitting? Anaphylaxis. 
why do we give them oxygen in anaphylaxis? But still come back to this one on fitting for me. OK. They're using energy. Yes. OK, so they're using energy. Um, so if they're using energy, oh, give me a little bit more detail. You are on the right ones. So dyspnea, uh, breathing ineffective when fitting. Good. OK, so it's this breathing ineffective. When we fit and our muscles go into spasm, also our breathing muscles can go into spasm and our airway muscles can go into spasm. Um, so, yeah, the brain not getting enough because it's not getting in. So when our muscles contract and go into spasm, we may kind of hold our breath, stop breathing. We see that hypoxia. So you're, you're on the money there. So the breathing will be ineffective during a fit or a seizure. And the other thing is, are you going to get a reliable SpO2 if someone's in the middle of a seizure? Um, generating more CO2. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that, Mike. Yeah, well done. Um, good. So, yeah, can't spell it. That's fine. I read it perfectly. Yeah. OK, the point is you cannot get a reliable SpO2 if someone's having a seizure because SpO2s don't like movement. Good. Sepsis. That's another one when we would give them lots of oxygen. Definitely. But they would be the opposite of some of the features. So in sepsis, they can be red. They can be warm to the touch and everything else. Stroke. No, 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 no. Do not give them oxygen during a stroke. Do not give them oxygen in a stroke. Stroke is on our green list. Why do we not give them oxygen during the stroke? Someone answer that for me. Yeah, drowning's on there, hypothermia is on there. Why do we not give them oxygen during a stroke? What is one of the properties of oxygen? What would oxygen do? Free radicals cause tissue damage. OK, good. I like that. Yeah, so the free radicals causing tissue damage. Yes. What is oxygen known to do? What is one of the body's natural um, O2 narrows the arteries? Good. Yes. Yeah, so oxygen is a vasal constrictor. And one of the things that a stroke could be is a clot in the brain. Do we really want that person to have a reduced level of oxygen again? No. The same if it's um, as, uh, um a myocardial infarction if they're having a heart attack. We don't give them oxygen for strokes or heart attack. They are both on our green list. So that's important. This is where oxygen could actually be detrimental and we could actually make the person worse. If their oxygen drops below 94, then we give it. OK, good. My last question before we kind of summarise then. Um, if you've got a COPD patient who is hypothermic, who is drowning, who is septic, who is anaphylactic, um, who is fitting. So you've got a COPD patient. Um, can you give them lots of oxygen or would you give them reduced oxygen? So a few people say yes. Give up and go home. Some people are saying reduced. No. OK, so you actually give these people lots of oxygen. So you would start them off on lots of oxygen, although they might have COPD and everything else. Yes. So yes, until at their level. Good. Um, if they're hypoxia, good. So the reason you're giving the oxygen is to treat the new cause of whatever it may be. Um, and that cause is the same level of oxygen, whatever their history is. But then we can reduce it down. OK, what is the worst possible outcome if you gave a COPD patient too much oxygen? What's the worst possible outcome? Death. <laughs> That's the same for everyone. OK. Um, interesting that COPD patients get NEBS uh, with 100 percent oxygen. Um, 
come back to you on that one, Rog. They stop breathing. Hypoxic drive. Rog, remind me to come back to that one on there. Yes. So what happens is they go into hypoxic drive. Now, we mentioned earlier that our brain measures levels of CO2 in the blood vessels. But somebody with COPD has a high level of CO2. CO2 is acidic. And essentially, the high levels of CO2 over time will burn away the receptors which are picking up the levels of CO2. So that means a COPD patient no longer has those receptors and their brain no longer picks up the levels of CO2. So what it then does, the brain goes to its next, its backup receptors, which pick up low levels of oxygen. And the COPD patient will now breathe when they have low levels of oxygen because they've always got high levels of CO2. So as their COPD gets worse, they go into this hypoxic drive and this becomes the norm for them. But not every COPD patient is in hypoxic drive to start with. That builds up over years and years and years, depending on the severity of it. So as their CO2 gets higher, as they retain more and more CO2, they then burn off these normal receptors. That then sends them into hypoxic drive. And hypoxic drive means their drive to breathe is on low levels of oxygen. If that is then the case, when you give them oxygen, they lose their drive to breathe which means the brain says, hey, I've got loads of oxygen, you don't need to breathe. So they reduce their breathing, they stop breathing, and potentially they die. How will you identify that? How will you identify it? How will you identify that they're in hypoxic drive and they're going down? Respiratory rate drops, Excellent. So that was the biggest one I wanted. Colour will change as well. You're absolutely right. SpO2 readings, yes, you can ask them. Absolutely. But what I wanted to really get to is their respiratory rate drops. So you need to be continuously monitoring and recording the patient observations and you need to document when you give them oxygen. So if someone's having a seizure and you give them 100 percent oxygen via a non rebreathable mask, that is absolutely fine. But once you've done the treatment, you will then monitor and record your observations, including their SpO2, their respiratory rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then as time goes on, you will re-monitor and re-record. And if you notice that their breathing rate is deteriorating down and their breathing rate goes into normal parameters, 12 to 20, and their oxygen improves, you then need to reduce your treatment. If their breathing rate continues to drop 10 reps, 8 reps, and you've still got oxygen on them, you need to start asking yourself, could this be hypoxic drive? And by now, you've started to get some more observations, more history, and then you can kind of work out. And if they do stop breathing, take the oxygen off them and they start breathing again because their body suddenly says, hey, I've got low levels of oxygen. I need to breathe. So that's a really interesting one. And I could probably talk all day on them kind of subjects, but very, very interesting. I want to go back to Roger's point. He said that it's 100 percent oxygen via a nebulizer. That's not quite true, Roger. OK, the oxygen cylinder, whatever comes out of the cylinder is always 100 percent oxygen. So it always comes out and depending on the mask that they have will depend on how much oxygen goes into the body and how we quote the percentage of oxygen they have. So if you had that oxygen tube and it basically put it straight into your mouth and you didn't breathe anything else other than the tube, you would get 100 percent oxygen. So with the non rebreathable masks, what happens is, is that oxygen tube goes into a bag. You then breathe whatever is in the bag. 
So every time you breathe in, you breathe 100% oxygen because you're always breathing from the bag. Um, but if you give them a medium concentration mask, a nasal cannula or a nebulizer, there is also holes in the mask around. So as they breathe in, they are breathing in the 100% oxygen, which gets mixed with atmospheric air, and that reduces the total oxygen percentage which goes into the lungs. So they actually get a reduced oxygen level through a nebulizer, through a medium concentration mask, and through a nasal cannula. So they still get oxygen, but it's a reduced amount because they are breathing atmospheric air as well. Give it with a nebulizer is a very small amount because there are only small holes in the side, but that's the way it technically works. And if you got very, very technical about it, the non-rebreather mask, they actually only breathe 80% oxygen because it's not a complete seal. It only sits over the top. So it's not completely sealed um, around there. Um, COPD patients often do not restart breathing once O2 has stopped um, because the acid uh, builds up and, and has an anesthetic, uh, anesthetic effect. You are right. Um, I've seen two patients that I've um, accidentally given them too much oxygen. Thankfully, touch wood, both of those started breathing again. But in all fairness, they didn't stop breathing. I caught it when their breathing got reduced. OK, um, sure, but it is high flow O2, not four litres per minute. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify that again, Roger, whatever oxygen comes out of a cylinder is 100 percent oxygen. The flow rate will change. OK, so the flow rate changes, but it is always 100 percent oxygen comes out of the cylinder. And depending on the flow rate um, and the mask, that is where we get the mix from. OK, guys, we've gone over half past seven now, so I want to draw this to a conclusion. We have covered loads of different aspects tonight. I feel we have. We've concentrated on breathing and we've concentrated on dyspnea, which is that difficulty in breathing, shortness of breath, that acute kind of episode on it. Um, is there anybody who would like to ask any questions either in the chat or uh, verbally, or is there anything anyone wants to add? Um, a diver can have a pulmonary embolism uh, stroke fit. So are you saying that because um, when you're diving, you change the pressure in your body? Um, so that changes the partial pressure changes. And this is where you can get the bends and you can have embolisms of air traveling around your body as well as pulmonary. Um, yeah, please, Pete, by all means, do come on. Unmute. Okay. So when a, when a di we're talking about a diver who's got um, uh, a tank of, of compressed gas on his back. We're not talking about free divers or somebody who's diving without equipment. So as a diver goes down, the pressure that, of the air mixture that he's breathing increases with depth. In air itself, about 78% of air is made up of nitrogen. Because you're breathing at a higher pressure, the nitrogen gets absorbed into your bloodstream, your muscles, your bones, and all around your body. What a diver does when he comes up is he decompresses. And what the de decompression does is you sit at particular depths for a particular length of time, and the nitrogen slowly comes out of your tissue, into your bloodstream, goes through your lungs, and gets exchanged safely. If that diver comes up too quickly, it's a bit like a fizzy drinks bottle and all the nitrogen suddenly starts bubbling and fizzing out of your tissue and bone. And then it goes into your bloodstream and you get um, all kinds of issues with gases causing blockages. Uh, more than likely, the, uh, the diver is going to die. The only, the only treatment you can do is to try and flush the nitrogen out of his system. And the only way you can do that is to lie them flat on their back and to give them 100% oxygen for as long as possible. Absolutely. Very, very few divers survive um, rapid ascent, it's called. Excellent. 
That, that was brilliant. Thank you for that, uh, Peter. Very, very much appreciate it. And obviously, you've got a lot of experience around that field as well. So a good wealth of knowledge there. So uh, we'll be well worth, um, you know, maybe linking in with Peter, um, having a chat, and maybe we could have just a session around, you know, that kind of things in the future, which would be excellent. Good. Is there anything anyone else wanted to add? Anything anyone wanted to ask? Um or anything anyone wanted to, you know, jump in with there. So it's been my voice quite a lot tonight. Um, so if anyone does want to, please, by all means, do so now. Okay. I, think a point, I think a point you made once before was that you can get somebody with um, mucus in their lungs and they, their, their sats can be quite low and they can have a good cough. Yeah. and cough it up and their sats can go up quite um, quite quickly. I saw that once and it was, I had a, a, a person and their sats were going up and down as they coughed and I I, I sort of, you know, you, you noted it and, and whatnot, but it's quite interesting to know that that was, went from what you said, that that, that occurs more than just in the odd occasion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Roger. Definitely good. Um, Aaron, horrible person has just put a very disgusting picture up of a glove which has purposely been made with the observations on it ready to write down. The only thing I would remind you, if you do wear a glove like that, that is then a legal document and that then goes to um, court um, as evidence. Um, so I do not want one of those gloves. They are clinical waste. Do not write on your gloves. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, if everyone is done, and please, by all means, come in with other questions or bits and pieces. Um, but if everyone's done, can I get you to drop out of this um, as quickly as you can? And I'm just going to stay on for a little bit and just say goodbye for the YouTube viewers. Um, and I will put this onto YouTube. Excellent. So, yeah, lots of thank yous. You're more than welcome, guys. It's great. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, uh, lots of people in tonight, which is excellent. People are dropping out. Good. Excellent. Well done, everyone. Well done. You're more than welcome, uh, guys. Help. Help. Who's that? Roger. Oh, Roger's leaving. Good. Still got PR and Aaron in there. Get you guys to drop out for me. Pete's leaving. Just get Aaron to leave as well. Excellent. There you go, guys. OK, so thank you very much. There's the end of our breathing session. Um, hopefully you did enjoy it. Um, but, you know, just kind of um, emphasize the importance of all these kind of bits and pieces. Our bodies are absolutely fantastic mechanism. To be a really good medic, what you need to do is understand how the body is constructed, how the body works with different processes, and then what's normal. When you understand what is normal, you can then, when you find something abnormal and wrong, you can start working out what has gone wrong. And then once you know what's gone wrong, you can work out how to fix it. I really, really do hope you can join us for the next session where we're going to be looking at circulation. I will see you in the next video.